Well, it's my great pleasure. Good morning to everybody from my side. It's my great pleasure after the wonderful uh, first lecture of Georges Dibon uh, to introduce our uh, next speaker, who is Uwe Flechner, professor of art history, University of uh, Hamburg, and director of the Warburg House in Hamburg. Please. As far as some art critics are, were concerned, there was nothing self-evident about exhibiting works by the French painter Edouard Manet in early 20th century Germany. When Paul Cassira put more than 20 paintings and some pastels and watercolors to the artist, by the artist from the Auguste Pellerin collection on show on, uh, in Berlin in spring 1910, the critics emphasized Manet's uncompromising contemporaneity, which demanded more of viewers than any other modern 19th century painter. Even his admirers would admit that his pictures often had, I quote, a touch of unapproachability and hence required maximum receptivity. One of the visitors to the exhibition who quite evidently displayed the necessary sensitivity and intellectual attitude to Manet's works was A.B. Warburg. The Hamburg art historian wrote to his wife Mary that during his visit to the Kunstsalon Cassira on 1 April 1910, he had seen, I quote, a glorious Manet exhibition. On display were mainly portraits and genre-like everyday scenes, such as Nana, Au Café, or Un Bau Folie Bergère, significant works that documented Manet's idiosyncratic position between realism and impressionism. However, it is not quite clear what may have struck the art historian as glorious about these works and why he was specifically interested in this painter's works, for none of the exhibited pictures obviously corresponded to Warburg's field of interest at that time. Yet it may be said that Warburg came to the exhibition with a very distinct prejudice. For in 1908, he had read a short essay called Raphael und Manet by his colleague Gustav Pauli, in which the then director of the Kunsthalle in Bremen reported his discovery, or rather rediscovery, of the fact that the French painter had based the figures in his 1863 painting Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe on a paraphrase of mythological figures whose genealogical line he could trace back to ancient sarcophagus reliefs via a lost drawing by Raphael on the subject, this judgment of Paris, reproduced as an engraving by Marc Antonio Raimondi in 1530. Pauli had already realized that this, in his view, successful assimilation of a traditional pictorial invention in the modern painter's work, one that would have unsuspected implications for Warburg's understanding of historical migrations in motive, was unique testimony to the long durée of pictorial transformation processes. I quote Pauli, but just as a ray of light from the most distant stars reaches us, an idea of form that flashed into being in a human brain thousands of years ago may take on a new form in our own age, end of quote. Although Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe was not among the works Warburg was able to see in Berlin in 1910, it seems likely that his enthusiastic reception of the Manet exhibition was indeed influenced by his knowledge of at least individual ancient sources in his work. Some years later, in spring 1928, Warburg seized further opportunities to study the painter's works in the original. Thus, on 19 April, at Galerie Cometa in Hamburg, together with Gertrud Bing, he saw an, I quote, incomparably beautiful picture by Manet, a portrait of the painter Bert Morisot. But a visit 
to the first German retrospective of Manet at which uh, the Galerie Matthiesen in Berlin presented almost a hundred of the artist's works would be of even greater importance to him. In March 28, during a trip to Berlin, full of delicate business appointments, Warburg had suffered a serious heart attack. Yet despite this, or perhaps even because of it, he had attended the exhibition of work by the painter he so greatly admired. Later, and not without pathos, the art historian would recall this encounter with Manet's work. Indeed, he even said he wanted to become one of the painter's followers in order to overcome the acknowledged problems of pictorial history. I quote, Manet precedes me with the leader's torch and I will follow. The first thing I did after the dangerous heart attack in Berlin was only too logically attend the Manet exhibition with Gertrud Bing. In 1928, Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe was again not among the exhibited works, which included, for example, the portraits of Zacharia Struck and Emile Zola, Le Balcon, um, as well as some studies of missing major works such as L'Execution de Maximilien uh, from 1867. Yet even Without Warburg's most important evidence of his intensive preoccupation with the painter, the direct confrontation with Manet's work had a thoroughly apotropaic impact on the art historian. Quoting a Latin motto that played on the artist's name and thus Manet had and that Manet had chosen for his book plate, Warburg claimed the pictures had had nothing less than a heartening, healing effect on him, given his state of health, which had almost forced him to break off his trip to Berlin. Manet, Manibet. He persists, he will persist, Warburg noted in the diary of the Kulturwissenschaftliche Bibliothek, adding a confident exclamation mark to the Latin verb forms. He thus evidently perceived the self-assured statement by a controversial artist as a protective spell against the existential threat of his illness and also, and perhaps even more importantly, as an encouragement to overcome all the methodological problems in the study of pictorial migrations from antiquity to his own day. The fact that in the etched book plate whose motto had been devised by the Parisian publisher Auguste Poulet Malassis in 1874, Félix Braquemont had specifically given the portrait of the painter the form of an ancient looking herm, complete with brush and palette as a sheaf of trophies, and hence made Manet's updating of ancient art well nigh problematic, a programmatic, must have been an additional motive for Warburg to relate the pun to himself and his work on the afterlife of antiquity. Admittedly, German art critics' reception of Manet had finally changed in 1928, and the artist was now above all under the influence of expressionism, largely seen as a historical figure, I quote, revolutionary and conservative all at once. And his relationship to older art, for instance, Velasquez, had been recognized as, I quote again, one of the great still crossable bridges that connect us to a great past. Yet the fact that an academic art historian was preoccupied with a modernist painter and would even cite him as a witness for a paradigm-changing historical model was a quite remarkable event in the 1920s. But Warburg, ever a border crosser, set to work after attending the Berlin retrospective and by May 1928, he had incorporated Manet's painting Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe into the first photographically documented version of the Mnemosyne Atlas. In this early, still very hesitant plate, testimony to the Renaissance reception of antiquity, such as Raphael's The School of Athens, his triumph of Galatea, 
or the dome mosaic based on a design by the artist for Agostino Chigi's 1516 funerary chapel was very tentatively linked to ancient works with Manet's painting at the bottom edge of the plate serving, let's say, as a forecast right up to Warburg's own time. In later versions of the Atlas, Warburg argued far more specifically, for he now referred to concrete, concrete migrations in motive and investigated all the pictorial material revolving around Raphael and Manet in terms of how, I quote Warburg, of how plein air, plein air as a substitute for Olympus achieved its effect. <coughs> When Warburg set off for Italy in autumn 1928 to tap additional pictorial and text sources for his series and, among other things, to prevent the provisional state of his research at the exhibition, which accompanied a lecture entitled Roman Antiquity in Domenico Ghirlandaio's Workshop at the Biblioteca Herziana, he was also preoccupied there with the iconological pedigree of Manet's Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe. On an excursion to Tivoli in December 1928, Warburg discovered in Nicolas Berchem's painting, The Judgment of Paris, at the Villa d'Este, a mid 17th century adaptation of Raphael's pictorial invention, which he described, alluding to Goethe, as a, I quote, as a droll incisive bone, Zwischenkieferknochen, a droll incisive bone between the sarcophagus. Raphael and Manet, thus perceiving it as a previously missing evolutionary link in a motive migrating from antiquity to the present day. He included this find, as well as Manet's painting, in his exhibition plate, in which he interpreted the reception of antiquity by, above all, 17th century Dutch artists as an inversion of energy. The whole Roman picture series was the subject of Warburg's greatest methodological challenge during this period. I quote, the significance of the restitution of ancient formulas of pathos for an energy-based historical theory of expressive value. <coughs> However, while Warburg was still in Rome, the visual confrontation of figures from ancient and early modern depictions of the judgment of Paris with Manet's idyllic open air scene gave rise to a separate series of pictures that summed up his research not only on the French painter. Under the title Manet and Italian Antiquity, he produced five plates with a total of over 250 reproductions which he gave to his closest colleague, Gertrud Bing, as a birthday present after a number of private lectures on the subject. These collected pictorial arrangements extended from Dürer's early preoccupation with the sublimation of ancient formulas of pathos, plate one, via examples of the mixed style or of reception of antiquity or Sandro Botticelli's ideal style, plate two, to the central Raphael Manet tableau, plate three, and thence via late medieval astrological illustrations, plate four, to ancient and post-ancient depictions from the fields of solar iconography, the fall of Phaeton, and various ascensions, plate five. The mere fact that the four plates Warburg arranged as a framework round the eponymous central tableau included essential pictorial complexes that had preoccupied him through his life as a researcher, starting with his dissertation on Botticelli, shows just how important this series of pictures must have been to the art historian. In a letter to Fritz Sachsel on 17 April 1929, Warburg actually described the accompanying text, which he had initially wanted to publish in a yet to be edited form on the century, centenary of the German Archaeological Institute in Rome. He called it as the conclusion of his planned theoretical introduction to the Mnemosyne Atlas. 
that in making a present of the plates to Gertrud Bing, who gave him crucial support in all his research and had accompanied him to Italy, he had expressly wished to thank the woman he considered such a personally important, quote, impression assistant and expression verifier, also speaks of the particular importance Warburg attached to his money and Italian antiquity series. What we have here is a veritable work biography in Nutze, or rather in Imagine. The central plate in the Mani and Italian antiquity series is not only devoted to evidence of a motive afterlife, which Warburg would certainly have considered a banal demonstration of what here would in any case have seemed an obvious state of affairs. The arrangement of pictures ultimately aims at the changeable, I quote, process of confrontation with demons of destiny from antiquity up to the present day and attempts to show which path art followed until it was able to achieve the perfect expression of human freedom in the pastoral idol of Manet's painting. This, I quote again, seemingly so uninhibited luncheon group. On the left-hand side of his visual essay, the art historian assembles examples of resting, self-absorbed figures from the Cisalpine and Transalpine Renaissance, the most important of which display the melancholy, suffraceny pose of the supported head, such as Michelangelo, the prophet Jeremiah, or Dürer's Melancholia I. I quote, searching for the cause of the surviving power of an ancient looking predisposition in gestural expression, as Warburg explained in a letter to Gustav Pauli on 14 February 19, uh, 1929, I indeed first spent years looking for and proving the surviving expressive value of mimic exaggeration. The other negative side of gestural expression the attitude of the self-absorbed individual now stands beside the first question with the same claim to exploration. Here it is already apparent that, for example, the position of Melancholia I in Dürer is a modified and hence in itself quite independent river god pose. End of quote. The right-hand side of the plate shows a pictorial complex of the judgment of Paris, from the ancient sarcophagus reliefs to Manet's painting. Here, Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe and Raimondi's engraving were shown twice, first as a neutral working reproduction and again in their direct motivic confrontation on the corresponding printed page from Gustav Pauli's 1908 essay. As if hinged, the two sides, to put it rather simply, were linked to astrological depictions of the planets, above all with examples of planet children, evidently in order to demonstrate the supposed influence of planetary constellations on people's moods. Since in this rare instance, an explanatory text by Warburg, dealing almost entirely with a central plate in his series of pictures, has survived, we can use it to form a fairly clear idea of the complex composition of over 50 reproductions. Here the author first outlines the iconological genealogy of Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe, and its discovery by Pauli, and soon discusses the decisive moment of his own interpretation. I quote, the reallocation of the psyche of depicted humanity in energy terms takes place in seemingly quite insignificant deviations in the interplay of gestures and facial expression. Warburg described this inversion of mental expression as an act of emancipation, which he demonstrates with meticulously analytical descriptions of the gradual shifts in motive. In the ancient depictions, the group of persons, later quoted by Manet, is supposedly still under the spell of awe-inspiring apparitions of gods, for Jupiter and soul as, I quote, lords and masters of the angry, radiating world of light, 
compel them to gaze raptly at the heavenly apparition. But the cultic gestures, he continues, become in Raphael's depiction, I quote again, a mark of free humanity that perceives itself self-assuredly in the light, which is already aiming at earthly beauty and the aestheticizing view. Yet the, I quote again, overwhelming theophany of the forces of light in the sky, supposedly only vanished in the works of Berchem and Manet. In the French artists painting, the gazes of the nymph and her companion addressed a viewer, quote, who must be sought on earth, not in the sky. Whereas, as Warburg explained in a detailed letter to his wife on 21 February 1929, Raphael, or Raimondi with the automobile image vehicle of his engraving, had thus introduced the spiritual emancipation from pagan ritual. In Manet's work, this was raised to a complex inversion of energy of traditional ancient expressive values. In place, of a phobic reflex as a response to numinous threats, the French painters calmly contemplating figures displayed a, I quote again, peacefully completed and earth's proximate surrender to the miracle of the eternal cycle of illuminated nature. In short, Warburg eventually raised the change in the human perception of fate-determining powers, which he recognized to a natural philosophical natural philosophy level. I quote, between the judgment of Paris on the pagan sarcophagus at Manet's Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe, there is a reversal in the theory of causality regarding elementary natural events. The imminent legality in natural processes as a personally inconceivable idea drives out all the wrangling Olympians with their human addictions from the sky. Even if the group of seven planets has to this day maintained in virulence and unimpaired astrological superstition, the great Olympian gods are no longer objects of the active official sacrifice, sacrificial cult since they were archaeologically sterilized." End of quote. As Warburg pointedly judges, Manet's role in this humanizing process was that of an enlightenment figure. Manet had read his Rousseau. The painter's art served the, I quote, battle for the human rights of the eye. His painting had arisen like a banner in the battle for light-seeking salvation from the fetters of academic virtuosity. But Warburg did not depict Manet as a protagonist of mere linear progress, but on the contrary, as an artist whose genius was revealed in the complex dialectic confrontation with the art of the past, striding onwards towards the light. That means both the Enlightenment and Impressionism, as the numerous light metaphors in the text make clear. Manet appeared to him as a faithful executor who created new expressive values from careful transformation rather than an iconoclastic attitudes and whose works had thereby achieved captivating persuasive force. With the military metaphor of the banner, as with the earlier metaphor of the leader's torch, Warburg was again referring to the exemplary function that the artist had achieved for him. Yet the public character of the text, which was originally intended to be published, evidently kept the art historian from revealing the all too intimate personal aspects of such a view. However, Warburg's private commitment to Edouard Manet is evident from an important autobiographical reflection in the diary of the Kulturwissenschaftliche Bibliothek. <clears throat> On 3 February 1929, he briefly mentioned the methodological difficulties involved in working on his series of pictures on the French artist. And in concise keywords, he outlined the problem of the format formation of expressive value reflected in his plate figures between the polar contrasts of figures with ecstatic, the mannered, the nymph, and contemplative mental dis dispositions, the sensual river god, and elsewhere, the morning river god. 
an antagonism that he pathologized using terms from bipolar psychosis. I quote Warburg, manic depressive polarity. Here, Warburg formulated a lucid psychological self-awareness and granted himself and his readers a profound insight in his own mind. I quote, sometimes it seems to me that as a psychohistorian, I am attempting to read the schizophrenia of the West from the pictorial elements in an autobiographical reflex. On the one hand, the ecstatic nymph, manic, and on the other, the morning river god, depressive, as poles between which the faithfully forming impression-sensitive one attempts to find his active style. Here, the art historian not only reveals introspection as part of his own method, but his formulation also displays in the German original an interesting grammatical gap which perhaps helps to spur on the autobiographical reflex which Warburg embedded in a broader cultural history context and so, as it were, again depersonalized. For if we read the word impression sensitive, der Eindrucksempfindliche, as an adjective, readers must decide for themselves whether Warburg meant the impression sensitive artist or rather the impression sensitive art historian, that is himself. And if it were to be read as a noun, wrongly, for there is no capital letter in the German original, but this is a spelling lapse that Warburg not infrequently made, it would mean he deliberately left this crucial issue unresolved. There is plenty of evidence that not only at this point and not only in his institutional diary, Warburg entirely identified with the faithful executor Manet, and given that Warburg's understanding of language was unparalleled in his seismographic sensitivity, we may even speculate further about his linguistic ingenuity, for he can hardly have failed to realize that the French painter's name did not only include the pun on the Latin verb forms mani, manibit, but also the notion of manic, a linguistic coincidence that may have had a magical influence on the art historian. In any case, Warburg's psychological self-diagnosis shows that his preoccupation with Manet and the painter's secularizing struggle for emancipation from all the demons of destiny had a far-reaching implication for our understanding of the picture series Manet and Italian Antiquity for it contains not only the historical model of changing receptions of pictures from antiquity to the present, but as a psycho-intellectual self-portrait, it also performs a therapeutic function in the, in the existence of an art and cultural historian who during his lifetime wrestled with the demons of his own manic depressive existence. In his confrontation with Edouard Manet and his artistic act of liberation, he could prove to himself that he too persisted and would persist. Manet, Manibit. Thank you so much for patience.